Hi everybody, thank you for coming to my station, Let Us Reason Together Introduction. I'd like to talk about something that uh, a lot of people, you know, theologians, they have a debate. And I think I wrote it down a year on top of it. So Matthew 24, 40, 42, and Luke 17, 34, 37. The idea is, so the whole point is that one will be taken. Okay, so the interpretation is very important to understand. That's over there in 24 and 24, 40, 42. Um, then there shall be two men in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, and one will be left. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. This I'm going to talk about, and I'm taking this information by Dr. Thomas Ice. I really like him. He's a very good theologian, and I read so many of him, and I think he put all things together real quick, so I will read real quick all, everything, and everything, all the scriptures over here, is written, okay, on the board. So please, uh, you know, n pay attention, because I will go through it real quick, so, and so we, I'll, I, will, I will do it uh, in such a way that will still be understandable, okay? Um, the set over here, okay, the illustration used in this parable is straightforward in both examples. There will be, well, there will be a separation where one individual will be taken and the other left behind. Also in context, it is clear that one is a believer and the other is not. This describes a clear separation process. The question related to this passage is who is taken and who is left behind. Those who hold to pre-tribulationism have argued both ways on this issue. Does this refer to the believer being taken and the unbeliever left behind, or just the reverse, where the unbeliever is taken away and the believer is left to enter the kingdom? I believe, of course, the latter, okay, few is the correct, is the unbeliever who is taken away in judgment. Now, as I have been arguing throughout Matthew 24, okay, the focus is upon the second coming, while the rapture is nowhere is to be found in this passage. So you have to read the whole chapter, okay, of chapter of Matthew 24. See, in Matthew 24, our Lord is teaching about the events leading to his return, the tribulation event in Matthew 24, 4-26, uh, following by the revelation of his second coming, which is then, obviously, or, you know, which is then followed by the parable of, I mean, a, a drive home, lessons related to his previous teaching in Matthew 24, 32, and 251. That's that shit right there. So you have to, so you have to understand sometimes, you know, that the scriptures saying something, but you have to know what belongs to what, okay? Um, think it would, okay, Matthew 24, 32 to 51, I think it would be inconsistent to inter, uh, introduce parable about the rapture when he was not taught about that event in his passage. It is true that when the rapture occurred, there will be a separation of believers and unbelievers when we are snatched away from planet Earth. It is true that somewhere there will be people together and one is taken while one is left. However, that is not what is spoken in Matthew 24 because of the context. These parables are making points about what Christ taught in Matthew 24, 4-31. Uh, taking judgment, okay, uh, or salvation. The Greek word used in Matthew 20, 24, uh, 24, 40-41 is 
paralembano, made up of the root word lambano, which means to take or receive, and the preposition para, which means alongside of. Thus, the meaning of this verb is to take into close association, take to oneself, take with, along. The only place that I could find is that where the, in the verse is clearly used in this, about the rapture is of Christ's initial disclosure of this ministry, mystery in John 14.3. If you read over there, it says, I will come again and receive you to myself. Since paralambona is not a technical term that has the same meaning in every instance, it is used in the New Testament like any word in any language usage must be determined by how it is used in given context. Some have tried to argue that taken here refers to the pre-trip rapture. There's a small minority of pre-trip, pre-trip, my my words over there, three tribulations of the Ukraine to see those verses as a reference to the rapture. For example, David uh, L. Cooper said, the dominant idea is that the one who is a child of God will be taken, whereas the one who has never made his peace uh, with the Lord will be left to pass into the Great Tribulation. As Louis uh, Barber, uh, Barbary has noted, the Lord was not describing the rapture for the removal of the church will not be a judgment of the church. If this were the rapture, as some commentators or commentator, uh, comment, comment, uh, t -t 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 uh, affirm, the rapture would have to be post-tribulationist, for this event occurred immediately before the Lord's return in glory. Some have said that the paralembano beno is only used of positive, uh, positive relations. However, such is not the case. It is used of the Roman soldiers taking Jesus away from the Garden of Gethsemane to the uh, Praetorium and eventually crucifixion. And you can read it in. Matthew, I wrote it down over there, 27, and in John 19, 16. It is used of the devil taking Jesus with him to show all the kingdom of this world. And you can read it in Matthew 5, okay, of 4, 5 till 8. This, uh, this verb is also used in the um, exercise uh, demon, exer yeah, exercise a uh, demon returning to the newly swept house and taking with it seven other spirits. You can read it in Matthew 12, 40, 45. In Luke, the story, if you if you read it, you can you know remember that okay, Satan uh, okay discussed this matter as, as allowed. So oh, uh, Stan Towson discussed this particular matter. Just hope Towson about it because sometimes I jump the gun. Okay, you have to excuse me because my I know what they're talking about over here. Uh, Jesus was uh, telling us, you know, that a person was possessed, so to speak, or get out, the demon was, was get out, he roam around, and then he said, you know what, the heck with it, let me see what happened where my first house was, and he found out the house was nice and clean. Oh, he said, so it's nice and clean, so I can come back. So he came back with seven more stronger demons. Okay, and that's a warning. Okay, some people think just by doing something it goes away, but the only way I believe to get rid of demons, you have to be born again, but also you can plead the blood of Christ. The demons hate that. Okay, they cannot stand it. That's the power, folks. And I tell you more about it, you know, as time goes by, 
because I experienced it myself many times that I have to claim the blood of Christ for protection. You know, there I saw the danger coming up. Uh, certain people bump, bump, was trying to uh, hurt me, so to speak, or my family. And the Spirit spoke to me, so quickly I had a prayer. And I asked, you know, for the protection, for the help, asked for the protection, of, you know, for my family, for the whole, I mean, the angels around me. And I also asked the Lord to protect me with the precious blood of Jesus. Satan and the demons cannot stand it. They have to flee from it. Okay, that happened to me a couple of times. So I know what I'm talking about and I understand some people, you know, they are doing something wrong. Okay, so by they think, okay, now I'm doing wrong. For instance, alcohol or, or, or something, something is not bad, it's very bad. So they say, you know what, I'm not going to do it anymore. So in a nice way, they, they clean their conscience and their act, but it doesn't mean anything. The enemy still can come in and can harass you and, and even possess you because you have not been cleansed, cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Okay, so let's go a little further. In this, uh, is this the uh, description of the rapture of the church or taking the wicked of judgment. Those who take the uh, former position argue that to take Paralambano, uh, the verb used here is to be different, uh, differentiated from to take. The verb used in verse 39, okay, it is asserted that uh, Paralambano, okay, signifies the act whereby Christ received his own to himself. However, Paralama Beno is also used in a bad sense. You can read it in Matthew 4 and told you and in John 16. Matthew 4, did I say 5, 8? Yeah. And in John 19, 16. Right there. So you have to know the difference. Since it is a part of Parallel in thought with those who were taking in adjustment of the flood, it is best to refer, refer to those who were taking for judgment preceding the establishment of the kingdom. The difference in verbs can be accounted for on the basis of accuracy of description. The flood came and swept them all away is a good translation. I think you know what I'm talking about, Noah, okay? Now, he says, for me, the strongest reason to take the separation depicted in this passage as a reference to one's taken away in judgment is the context. It appears that Matthew 24, 40, 41 are illustration that was preceded it in Matthew 24, 36 till 39. Namely, Namely, that those who were not prepared in the days of Noah, years ago, were taken away in judgment by the flood. Verse 39 ends by saying, So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Clearly, the emphasis in this verse is on unbelievers being taken away in the judgment of the flood. Therefore, verses 40 to 41 drive that point home by giving a couple examples of the coming separation that will occur in this time of judgment. Okay? And it's not a name of here, Arno Gibeline, uh, I think, okay? That's what, that's what he says. Two classes were living in Noah's day. The one who were unbelievers, and these were swept away by the divine judgment. The other cl class was Noah and his house, and he and his own were left and not destroyed by the judgment. By the judgment, it will be so again in the coming of the Son of Man. The unbelievers will be taken away in the day of judgment and wrath. The others will be left on the earth to receive and enjoy the blessing of the coming age and enter into the kingdom which 
will then be established. So here again, there's different, but I believe, like on here, we have to understand the certain theologians, how they look at it. And it's always like this, scripture interprets script, but in the same token, you have to know what parts belongs to each other because a contextual, you have to, what they call it, a contextual consideration. So, what does it fit together, okay? A share majority so far, let's go to the parallel, okay? Parallel passage. Another reason to see Matthew 20, uh, 24 and 40 to 41, uh, okay, as illustrating one, ones who are taken in judgment is the parallel passage found in Luke 17, 24, 37. So here's a, they just look at it from both sides, okay? It is a preview section, okay? Luke 17, on 26 or 30, right? Christ speaks of the coming of the Son of Man being just like in the days of Noah and Lot. In both illustrations, it was the wicked one who was taken in judgment. Luke 7, 27, okay, uh, Luke 17, did I say that? Luke 17, yeah. Luke 17, 27 says, the flood came and destroyed them all. Luke 17, 28 till 29 says, did I say 28, 29? Well, you have to look at that, okay? Luke 20, yeah, okay. Luke, yeah, says, it was the same as happened in the days of Lot and destroyed them all. So that is in Luke 17, verse 28 and 29. So some, I didn't quite write it down, but you have to look at in between those things, okay? So, all those things, like I said, you have to know in the context of how the scripture is written down, okay? So, let's go ahead. Uh, it was said in the same happened in the day of Lot and destroying them all. Emerson added, in Luke 17, 34 to 36, given three illustrations of the separation of believers and unbelievers. Then the following question is asked by the disciples, when, Lord, this question means, where are the unbelievers taken? Very important point. May I repeat it again? The question, the, the, uh, the apostles, or, you know, the disciples ask them, where, Lord, not when, but where, Lord, where are they taken? Okay? And, of course, Jesus' answer, okay, this is, Wherever, where so no, wheresoever the body is, neither will the eagles be gathered together. Eagles in this context imply vultures who hover over and scavenge a dead corpse. It is a scavenger, right? Does anyone? would be able to see where the dead body is because of the vultures hovering above. And now you can go to Revelation 19, 17 to 21. Such language clearly supports the notion that the ones taken are removed to judgment. I hope this little thing is an eye-opener for some of you maybe are still confused and that's why I felt sharing this with you because I, I, I taught this okay but not that well I have to, I have to, I have to admit because I didn't know all the scriptures but I knew about Noah I knew about Lot I knew the story about uh, demons coming in and they take off and later come back sevenfold because the person uh, clean his act, which is a clean house, but not clean in such a way that the demons cannot come back. Because, demon, because what I'm saying is 
when you are born again Christian and Christ will live in you with the Holy Spirit, you are cleansed with the blood, you as a Christian cannot be possessed. He can harass you from the outside, but he cannot possess you. I know certain people believe, that, I mean, they teach different, but folks, it's wrong. A Christian cannot be possessed. He can or she can be harassed. Two different words. That's why we have to be very careful with what I said. When I felt the enemy or, you know, wants to hurt me, I call on the Lord, I pray, and that's how God protects me and my family. Okay? It's very important when you're in trouble as a Christian, you can do the same thing. Ask God for the, the angels to, to, you know, to, have to support you and to protect you. But you have to claim also that you to ask Christ to protect you with his blood. I will tell you a quick story that happened over here to a lady. And I met her. I know I knew her. And it was, she, was, she came from, from Holland. She came over to the United States. So she went to a city. But she was lost. So what happened now, while walking around, as a stranger, and knowing a little bit English, somebody stopped by with a car and to ask her for a ride. Said, and she asked him, well, I have to go to such Oh, he says, I know where it is. And nonchalant and naive, she went in the car. So of course, the person, the driver drove her to a certain point, where we were more isolated, and tried to do her some harm. Or in her, in her mind, as a Christian, she said it in Dutch. Under your blood, that means protect me, you know, with your blood, Jesus Christ. And the man jumped on her. When she said it, he jumped back. And he said, what do you say? And he did it three times. And three times she said the same thing. She, she, she called on the Lord to protect her with his precious blood. The third time he tried to do that to harm her, what happened now, something somehow opened the door, grabbed the guy, and threw him out on the street. So she saw that, she opened the door from her side, and ran to the first house she could find, and found rescue. This book is a true story. And people don't understand how important it is. As a Christian, you can't ask for, for, for you know, to ask Christ to, to protect you when you're really in a bad situation, to protect you with the blood, his, with, with His blood, you have the right as a believer to do that, and this is true. So I hope that this illustration, and also now you know what happened, who are the ones, where are they going to go. That is at the time when Christ come down, and if you look a little further, you can see when Christ come down, He will separate what. The sheep and the goats. Okay, the sheep are who are were good to to to, uh, to the Jewish people and our believers are still alive after the after the tribulation, and he says, "Come in my kingdom." Okay, and the other ones are of course uh, being put away and like for the false prophet and everything else. They have their place in you know in in Sheol. Okay, so. Here I'll give you a, a quick story, but the beautiful part is the, the illustration, the meaning of the scripture about Matthew 24, 40, 42. Like I said, I hope it helped you, and I hope the story I told you about the blood of Christ, that is true. I experienced myself, and this, this particular uh, believer, I did the same thing, so I would say, praise God for it. And I said to you right now, thank you for stopping by. If you got anything out of my uh, videos, give me the thumb up. If you like to subscribe, please ring the notification bell. And I will say then to you till next time. God bless you. Bye bye now.